all be good. Um, yep. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, thank you all for coming tonight to the uh, the Amateur Radio Experimenters Group. Uh, tonight we have uh, Scott um, Jackson giving us a talk about his pinball machine. Um, so, uh, Scott, it's certainly a different topic for uh, for all of us here. So, uh, kindly, uh, on behalf of all of us here, thank you very much and uh, take it away, please. Not a problem. I'll just do a quick sound check of the hall. Just give me a thumbs up, make sure that I'm audible. I should be fairly good. Yep, you're 10 over the 9. Perfect. Uh, very good. Okay, so um, let me pull up the slideshow for you all so you can actually see what's going on. All right, there we go. Uh, so yeah, so this evening I'm going to cover off sort of the start of the process uh, that I've uh, started in the past few months about restoring an electromechanical pinball machine. Um, I'm still learning a lot about it, but that's fine. That's that's why we're here to learn and engage. And, you know, I might learn a few things from other members that, that have played with uh, equipment of this era. So um, I'm certainly, so far has been an exciting journey. Um, who am I? I? I will give a brief introduction for those who don't know me, um, as Matt said. I'm Scott. Uh, first license, uh, probably about 12 years ago now, um, as VK5 FSKS. Um, ever since a young age, I've always had a keen interest in video games and arcades, bit pinballs, or you know the Daytona machines, um, and they've always fascinated me. I think it's down to the noise, the lights, and everything that they that they make. Uh, about six years ago, I made the journey uh, to VK2 via VK3 for about a year, um, just with, with various work uh, changes. Uh, in 2017, I upgraded to a full call, uh, and I managed to sneak through the exam system just before it changed from the WIA um, to the AMC, so that was um, a bit of a stroke of luck. Uh, my day job, what do I do for work? I work, uh, work in IT as a, as, a, as a general monkey, support monkey, uh, but play with all sorts of projects. I figure we can't have a presentation in a radio club without at least a photo of a tower. Uh, so the photo that you see at the top there is one of our uh, wireless repeater sites uh, for one of our clients. Um, nestled on top of a hill near a, a Telstra site. Uh, so yeah, it's got quite nice views. Why pinball? As I mentioned, they make fun noises. This one doesn't have speakers in it. It's got chimes and basically a miniaturized glockenspiel uh, and plungers actuate via coils and energized relays. They're difficult to play well. Um, I've not very good at mastering pinball yet and I've been playing them on and off for quite a few years now. The idea of owning a pinball seemed like a cool idea. Uh, and my mate Rob, uh, down in Newcastle, <laughs> persuaded me to get one. Uh, and I saw one cheap on Facebook, so I thought, why not? So the photo that you see there is is me standing next to the pinball machine uh, in the guy's shed. And you can see that it looks a little bit sore and sorry for itself, but we will go into detail about just how bad it is. The journey starts. So I was pursuing Facebook and obviously saw the pinball. Uh, and I rang, uh, rang my friend uh, from the Tamworth Tech Shed up here, and he's building a, a Thomas the Tank engine pinball as well. Um, so he was uh, good to, to get some experience off uh, and had a chat to him about it. He said, yeah, it, it looks good. It, it seems to all be complete. Uh, and it, you know, looks like it could be in working order. Uh, so... I decided to uh, go and have a look and we both went and had a look together and discussed, had a good look over it and found it was in fairly rough shape. I uh, spoke to Rob about it as well and gained his thoughts. I thought, well, he sort of said, don't pay too much for it. I made an offer and was accepted. So for uh, a premium sum of $450, we picked up this pinball machine. So what is the machine? Well, it's made by Gottlieb. Uh, Gottlieb was run by a Jewish family out of the United States um, in Illinois. It's an electromechanical era machine. So there are no circuit boards inside this machine. Uh, there is no microprocessors. There are no uh, you know, capacitors. There's no diodes. There's no bridge rectifiers. It is all AC 
wiring. And we will dive in a little bit later on to the circuit diagram. Uh, the machine is called Jungle, uh, but it does have some other names uh, it called Wildlife. Uh, that was the two-player version. Uh, and they also made two single-player single, ball, uh, single player, uh, versions of this game, uh, Jungle King and Jungle Life. So you um, may hear them referred to as an Adderball uh, version of the game. And you might ask what Adderball is. Well, it's a feature that was designed back in the days to reward a player in regions where replays or free games were outlawed as a thing of value. So a lot of states in America had very funny laws back in the day where pinball machines were seen as gambling. So they got around it by having an Adderball <laughs> version of a game. So that's uh, quite a quite an interesting uh, anecdote. Uh, the machines are manufactured in the late uh, later part of 1972, uh, and there are 5,775 in production, of which I have one of them. Um, so for pinball, that's actually quite a common machine. Um, you know, when you start to only have say 100 to 200 machines, then you're starting to get to be uh, a fairly rare uh, machine. Estimated cost, uh, once the restore is done, I would say probably two to two and a half thousand dollars would, would be a fair price <coughs> to pay for something like that. Back in the day, a lot of pinballs had a, a theme, and this is a, a fantasy themed uh, machine. And there's some features there as well. So flippers, pop bumpers, slingshots, star rollovers. Uh, and they're all switches, a couple of stand-up targets, spinning targets, action rings, which is the ring across the top of the play field. Uh, there's an outer lane on the left, a kickback, right outer lane, and a ball return gate as well. So in the 1970s, this was, this was state-of-the-art for pinball. <laughs> tools required. Uh, fairly basic tools. Um, screwdrivers probably uh phillips head and flat blade uh, are perfectly fine um a socket set would be ideal um just a little 3 8 inch drive set uh imperial should be all you need there's not really a lot of metric stuff in these machines being american or as they call it standard <laughs> a soldering iron is also recommended um if you're a purist such as myself uh lacing cord is recommended um, you'll see that in some of the later photos that I've got, you'll see how all the, the uh, wiring is loomed together. Um, and a multimedia, uh, a multimeter, of course, is, is recommended as well. Schematics uh, are very important. Um, it can be a little hard to get schematics for a Gottlieb machine because there is a company that still hold a lot of active copyrights on their equipment. Um, you will have to generally pay for schematics unless you know people in the right areas of the pinball restoration um, game. And I've got some links later on in the presentation. Solvents and cleaners, uh, namely kerosene and IPA, are the two that I've used and had very good success with. Um, degreaser as well, uh, you could use in, in place of uh, kerosene, but kerosene tends to work a little bit better, particularly if you let the parts sit in a kerosene bath. Uh, avoid contact cleaners and grease. Uh, pinballs of this era are not designed to be lubricated once they're reassembled. All that grease does is attract dirt, dust, and makes them gum up again, um, which is the name of the game in, in, in trying to fix and restore these machines is to get all the gumminess out of them. Uh, light machine oil is permissible in parts that have metals and metal moving. However, anything metal on plastic does not, again, need new lubrication. A nice to have, which I don't have, uh, would be an ultrasonic cleaner. Um, and you could probably use that in place uh, of a kerosene bath um, to really get the parts nice and shiny. Some people go absolutely nuts and polish things with Brasso and make all the chrome shine again. Um, I wouldn't really call myself a purist. I, I like to have that old patina look to things. And as you can see in this photo here, um, you can see 
that on the on the coin slot that's that's all surface rust main parts of the machine are the bottom board the play field the coin mech the chime unit the fuse board they're all sort of part of the bottom board assembly the back box and the cabinet and um, on the cabinet you've got legs and things as well uh, you've got the top glass on your play field as well so there's some images of what the bottom board looks like um, now if you'd like some higher res photos or larger photos uh, let me know and we can perhaps have a look at them after the uh, the presentation but as you can see we've got a lot of relays here it's all point-to-point -point wiring relays 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 and relays is the aim of the game uh over here you've got a great big whopping uh transformer and when we look at the schematics a little bit later on you will see that there is no fancy trickery it's all ac not dc and it's uh not lethal voltages obviously on the primary side of the transformer is 240 volt but within the machine you're sort of looking at 20 25 volts and, and 6 volt are your two two main voltages and here's a look at the backboard with a hammer you know to get rid of nests and whatnot that were hiding inside this machine and here's the little chime unit over to the right hand side that i was discussing earlier it's a, a little mini three note glockenspiel would be a a good way to explain it here's a bit of a look at the play field uh now you'll see there's some nicely loomed wiring and then you'll see some modern day fit in um relays in here and some blue colored wiring um again apologies for the smallish uh picture here i do have some some high res photos someone's been a bit skullduggerous in here as well with with electrical tape um that's not what we're about we're about trying to get this thing restored using loom the loom cord uh, they have since been removed, and we found out that they were an add-on for extra balls um, on the playfield. So this is the top side, or a snippet of the top side of the playfield. Uh, mine looks about like that. Um, you'll note that up the right-hand side here, uh, the the wood or the MDF is um, a little bit worn, but that's just because of where the the ball tracks uh, through the machine. There's a close-up of the chime unit here uh and then the coin mech as well uh we probably won't bother restoring uh full functionality of the coin mech uh we'll probably just pop the machine on free play uh and here is the game score counter and the fuse board as well so uh we've got a 25 volt 10 amp fuse uh, the play board has a 10 amp fuse and a light box has a 15 amp fuse way overkill uh, the machine doesn't draw that much current. It only draws about 100, 128 watts at the wall. So um, certainly well protected. Uh, my machine has played 85,927 games. Uh, and there's a little game counter here. Uh, I don't know if that is its original game count or if it's gone around the clock, so to speak. These funny plungers are tilt switches. So if you bang bang the cabinet of the machine around uh they'll they'll short out the game and you will have to restart the machine and you'll lose all your all your balls in play here's a good photo of the back box uh the back box in situ on the machine uh now one thing with our machine is there's a a, a metal sheet that we did not get included and that sits inside this metal track here you'll notice that uh it's in fair condition a lot of the plywood here at the corners is is coming apart and things like that um so one major drawback that it's had is all this wiring here you might see that it all looks the same color it's not meant to be a single color it's just that uv degradation over the years has got to the wiring so when we get to the troubleshooting uh after we get all the score motors and stuff pulled apart and rebuilt and we plug it all in on the bench uh, we could have a bit of fun trying to work out what's what. So um, a good tip with that is to just unloom the wiring and try and see the non-exposed parts of the wiring will still have their colouring. The plugs that you see here uh, are terminal strips or are known as Jones plugs. Um, and they're basically a pin, a pin and socket arrangement 
that they used back in the day. Um, and if you give them a good clean with with um, with alcohol and, and wet and dry sandpaper, they generally come up pretty good and they'll function fine. Here's the cabinet. The cabinet is probably our main concern. Uh, it's in rough shape. I'm not going to say that the cabinet is in pristine condition. It is far from pristine condition. I think the idea at this stage um, is we will remake the cabinet. We will measure it up. Uh, we will um, then buy some stencils and, and, and probably just remake it from scratch. We figure trying to bog it and glue it and make it square again is, is probably a, a, it's not a trivial way, but it, it'll be a muck around. Uh, my brother and I are, are sort of leaning towards just a full, a full cabinet rebuild. Um, so yeah, you can sort of see that the paint's peeling off and things like that. So bear in mind, it's a 1970s machine and I think it's had a, a fairly hard life. Um, so yeah, uh, we haven't really decided fully yet what we're, what we're going to do. Um, but yeah, we're thinking a full cabinet rebuild at this stage. So the first part of our job, we thought we'll tackle the back box and we'll rebuild all the score motors. So, um, well, they're not motors, they're reels. So on, on each score reel, you've got zero to nine. And because this is a four player machine, we have four lots of score reels per player. They're not overly hard to strip down and rebuild, but you need to be careful of springs, retaining clips and screws. Try not to lose them. Uh, check for cracks in the score reels. Check for burnt out coils, damaged sleeves and clean your plungers in your coils well. And you'll show, I'll show you a damaged coil and what that looks like in the next slide. Uh, degreaser and kerosene will clean up the parts and rinse them well once you've obviously cleaned them and let them air dry. They are fairly delicate plastics in a machine of this age, so be careful when you are working on them. Um, using light machine oil on the parts where the metal uh, will interface with metal um, is, is a good tip, and that can help the score reels um, action over quite well once they've been rebuilt. Um, what I might do, I might show uh, just a, a video. Uh, actually, I don't have that video on me. Um, but yeah, I've got a video that I can um, send out to the mailing list um, once once I get things done um, about um, how the score reels work once they've been rebuilt. But they should have a nice snappy action. And when you uh, accentuate the plunger, they will um, score from zero to nine. Uh, you will note that on the right-hand side photo, my brother's there and there is a little circuit board uh, on some of the score reels. And there's basically little actuators that go around in circles that contact different wires on the edge of the score reel. Um, as you can see, they've got wires there and that will count up the hundreds, the thousands, the tens, etc., etc., etc. And to clean up those boards, Brasso works fantastic. It'll just give them the polish and good contact. So here's our first casualty of the machine. Uh, this coil didn't survive. You can see it's heavily burnt and that would be caused by heat. Something's got really hot in this machine at some point in its life. And the middle photo here is the coil sleeve that goes inside the coil. And then a metal plunger slides through those coil sleeves. Um, basically magnetism is, is how, they, how they work. They're a solenoid essentially. So those coils are about $35 for a pair. Um, so I just bought two of them and I've now got a spare Gottlieb A9154 coil. This is a player unit that we stripped down and rebuilt and you can just see um, the cams over, over on the left here are just dirty. Um, you can see all the dirt in here and the grime after years and years and years of buildup. Um, all the spring mechanisms in here are just completely dirty and gummy, uh, but they, they do get cleaned and a kerosene bath cleans them right up. So this, uh, the way that this unit works is there's a series of contacts under here and you can see that the, there's a little contact here that engages with different circuits within the machine 
and then there they're controlled by relays on the back box and then relays down on the player in the bottom board as well. Um, and again, when we look at the schematic, it, it hopefully will become a little bit clearer about how these machines do work. It's, it's quite simple logic. Here's the play unit after it's been cleaned up. So you can see the pins are a lot more shinier. Again, I just use Brasso to clean up those pins. The cams have gone together. Um, this is the difference that the kerosene makes. You can see I actually have shiny metal under there. Um, and the cam is much cleaner as well. And I took I took the coil sleeve off here as well, um, just, to, just to make sure that it was okay. And by the age of some of this enameled wire, they've definitely been replaced over the years. So there's an example of how the um, the cam unit will line up uh, in a typical machine like this. Bear in mind, a lot of these machines in this era work exactly the same. Um, a lot of the manufacturers shared and stole ideas off each other uh, and they interface very similar to each other. So once you've repaired sort of one EM and get used to how they work, moving between Williams or Gottlieb and other manufacturers of the day and Bally, um, is a fairly trivial thing. So where to next? Um, that's sort of where we're up to with our restoration. Um, we have started on the bottom board, but we haven't yet finished it. Uh, Christmas got in the way. Um, our tech shed was closed for the Christmas period. It's also been stinking hot. Um, we, we don't really fancy the idea of sitting in 35 degree heat um, in a tin shed trying to fix this thing. Um, so probably as the, as the weather starts cooling down, we'll start working um, on it a little bit more. Uh, the bottom board's got quite a bit of work to it. Uh, the score motor will need to be pulled apart and rebuilt. Um, so that'll be quite a, a task within itself. There's a lot of switches on there. There's a lot, of, um, a lot of relays and stuff around that as well that we'll need to clean up. The play field will need to be cleaned up. We started on that by removing all the old erroneous relays that were too modern and didn't look right. Um, for the most part, we haven't checked rollover switches and things yet, but they're generally fairly simple in operation. So um, we, we don't have any doubts that they'll we'll have any problems. We need to decide, do we want to clean up the cabinet or repair it completely or repair it? So do we want to clean up and repair or do, or do a full rebuild? We haven't decided yet. And then obviously the last part is check all the wiring and the logic. And the schematics definitely come into play. Without schematics, um, yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing. So, schematics, what is it? There's lots of wires. There's lots of switches. There's lots of coils. There's lots of relays. There's bulbs, but not as many as you'd think. Um, what I'm going to do, I will bring up um, the uh, schematic for you all so you can have a bit of a look. Um, so I uh, fortunately managed to get a really nice resolution schematic. Um, so um, for, for me, that, that, that worked out quite well. So you can see um, down here, the line cord comes in and there's all of a 5 amp slow blow fuse protecting the the circuit and there's an on-off switch straight into the primary of the transformer. Uh, so uh, complete lack of capacitors for filtering <laughs> because you can't have them. Um, we, we need AC in here. Um, so you could probably put filtering caps in um, to help out with that. Uh, and then we've got a 5 volt tap and a 25 volt tap that's it there's no rectification um, in the machine um, at all you've then got some fuses that i shown earlier um, on that board as well so that provides some secondary protection um, to the um, to the back backboard the back box at the play field and the, and the bottom board and the transformer is tapped for 230 volt but you can also tap these for the american market as well so moving up, um, you can see there's lots of relays, tons of relays, and they all have uh, their own um, process within the machine. 
Um, you've got a motor here. That's your, your score motor and then switches as well. So the switches will determine um, the contacts and how they are normally open, not open. You then come up to the play unit that we then looked at as well um, in the earlier slides. And yes, it is weird. What looks like capacitors are switches. <laughs> so there's circuit diagrams back in the days. I'm uh, just reading through the, through the, um, <laughs> through the, through the, um, the chat on Zoom. <laughs> so yeah, they are they are switches. So you can then see there's the switches there, and this is the play field switches as well. And and the different runout switches that are available to the to the machine. And we'll keep coming up. So you can sort of see how it's all connected. It's simple, but working out the logic of, of the machine is certainly going to be a little bit of fun. And here's your uh, your first player, your second player, your third player, and your fourth player. So this is all your how your scoring works. And you can see how it's all interconnected through the matrix and the scoring matrix. And you can see that how where the connections are is to how different areas of the um, of the machine operates. It's very much like ladder logic, uh, Chris. Correct? Yes, very much like ladder logic. So yeah, coming up through there, and you can see it. It's all it's all fairly straightforward uh, logic. And then you come over to the, uh, the the bulb bus. And again, it's a very similar scenario. There's just tons of bulbs. And then different, different based on different positions of the switches, different bulbs will obviously um, light up. And then you've got your, your protection fuses over here. So here's all your relays and your control banks and the, and the various contacts so by the um, by the contacts and their use, you can work out how how the machine logic works. You've then got some other coils that they use in these machines as well. Um, so yeah, working all this out, it's just a process of elimination. Play the machine, work out what doesn't work, then you then you work it out one by one. Um, here's the motor switch positions as well. Uh, that are available too. So the motor switch is, is down in the in the bottom board. Um, and I'll show a video of that in a sec in action and you'll see how it rotates and how the different switches actuate. And then the sequences will then per third revolution and degrees will work out how they how they all contact. So that's a good look over the schematic. Um, I had my schematic printed out on an A1 uh, plotter that I have access to through through my work. Um, and that's uh, been laminated. So that's been a great help for me as well. Um, that's about all I've got. Um, I didn't want to make it too long and too laborious, but I, I will open it up to questions. And there's some resources there. So um, pinrepair.com uh, on the electromechanical section has got some great tips on repairing these machines. Um, the Goat Sheb. EM pinball repair guys uh, down in Newcastle are an awesome resource as well. Um, and my mate Trev at the Tamworth Tech Shed um, has been a great resource as well. So, um, yeah, it's it's been certainly a fun journey so far. It's been quite relaxing and therapeutic, pulling apart pinballs and cleaning things and putting it back together and getting involved in how they work. So I'll definitely do a part two to this presentation once the machine's up and running. And um, we'll work out from there, um, you know, further details of what I encountered, what problems I had, what issues I faced and how I solved them. So I'll open it up to, uh, to the floor um, for any questions. There's a couple of questions on uh, YouTube, Scott. One was uh, from ham radio crash course does this machine have the gunshot noise maker so just repeat that question again i just had a bit of repeated audio uh the question was does this machine have the gunshot noise maker 
Uh, no. No. Uh, there was also another question. Uh, t- this is from VK3YE. Do many salvage pinball machines reek of beer and tobacco? Uh, not mine, but it's certainly got... Uh, it's certainly got that old electronic smell. Um, mine doesn't reek of of cigarettes and tobacco, but I I I have come across a few stories of uh, a lot of pinballs, particularly the old wooden rail ones, used to have built in ashtrays back in the day. Um, so they're the sort of machines that stem from the 1930s and 1940s. Um, they definitely do smell of um, smell of tobacco and, and alcohol. So yeah, uh, that's that's quite a quite a quite a funny um, funny anecdote. And I do have a friend uh, at work who's actually got one sitting in his shed. So he's sort of keen to see how I go, and then he's going to give me his to then restore. So um, certainly a lot of fun. Hey, I'm Chris Five CP. I've um, got three questions. So the first question is, how does the scoring system work? As it looks like when you when it hits a bumper or whatever. Um, energizes the motor, the motor turns and adds a little bit of score. Is, is that the way it works or is it something yes. different? Nope, 100%. Yeah, so as you hit a target on the uh, on the play field, it will, it will gradually increase the score based on what you hit. So if you hit the 1,000 point pop bumper, your score will, will count up 1,000 as it, as it happens. And, and then and- also um, it will obviously chime the plunger as well based on how many points you have and how does it work out player one versus player two etc and and do the scoring for each player uh that part i haven't got to yet in the schematic um i'll just re-pull up the schematic because basically it comes down to there's a player unit in the um in the top of the um machine and that counts up to 15 and then that, based on the number that that's at, and the contact and that cam lineup, um, is is based on how. Um, so this in the in the manual, uh, it will be. I'll just. So in the manual here. That's fine. You can do it. You can do it in in the second version. Yeah. So that the player unit, the player unit takes care of all that. All right. And the last two questions was: Is the board hand painted, and do the metal balls ever wear out? The metal balls do wear out. Um, ours is pretty worn out and deformed. Uh, and yes, the the back glasses are, are printed with with paint um they're all hand painted and and the the play the play boards are also hand painted um and also um the cabinet which you may be able to see uh a little bit there's speckling there's black speckling on the on the cabinet and they designed that and did that back in the day to try and um stop people from copying the machines easily so um it was sort of their painted to design type thing. So, yeah, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the times back in the days, um, people would rip machines off blatantly because that's that was the done thing. So to try and all compete with each other, it's quite interesting looking into the history of these machines. Yeah, awesome. Hey, Scotty, uh, Matt Five ZM. My question yeah. is: How many hours have you spent restoring this machine, and how many more hours do you think you need to spend? <laughs> Uh, look, conservatively, I would say so far I've probably put about fifteen to sixteen hours into it. Um, bearing in mind this is the first time uh, through a machine like this, so I'm wanting to take my time and and try and document the process as much as I can. Um, that's split between three people: so myself, my brother, and Trev. So collectively, already now, probably about. I, w- I would say probably about 30 odd hours roughly um, on, on the machine in terms of restoration. I would say mm, probably another 100 hours, I would think, for, for the remainder of the restoration. Um, it depends upon how far we want to take it with the cabinet. 
the ultimate goal is to have it ready for for Pinfest, uh, and we'll take it down to Newcastle and pop it in the electromechanical lineup down there. And that's around October, November um, this year. So the the goal is to have it done by then. Yeah, awesome there, Scotty. And uh, my last question is, uh, what type of coins does it take in the coin slot? 10 cents. So it's not a quarter? Uh, no, it is It is 10 cents. Um, and I have checked that because when we pulled the machine out, there were a few 10 cent coins um, laying around in the machine. Ah, awesome. Uh, no worries, yeah. thanks for that. I'll, I'll check and see. Is there any more questions here from Adelaide? Here we go. Hang on, I'll hand you around. No worries. Uh, Mark, 5 AV key. My first thoughts were of lots of solenoid rewinding and the EH did show we burnt out solenoid. And yep. uh, yeah, we're able to get spares. So are spares available for these you, things. Yes, yes, you can get spares. Um, I can't remember the exact uh, name of the place in Melbourne, but yeah, there's a couple of places. Uh, there's a place in Melbourne um, where I got them from. I'll just have a look at it, at it are for you. spares or are they... Uh, um, um, a lot of the spares around nowadays are factory seconds. Um, so they are new, but they're new old stock. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, machines, like perhaps even the newer ones, uh, I, I would have thought all these would have, the uh, people who look after them would have scrapped them and they wouldn't be available. It wouldn't have escaped to the public. So what's the situation there? Um, no. Yeah, yeah typically places um where where you'll find these machines are things like pickles like your pickles auctions um a lot of the auction places uh will will auction off old old arcade equipment um and look there's nothing stopping you from going to an arcade supplier as a member of the public saying hey i want to want to buy a pinball machine um people do do it um and there are pinballs fairly often knocking around on the secondhand market um not so much in a country area where i am though um, I was, mine was a bit of an exception to the rule, uh, but particularly in Newcastle, where the pinball scene is quite vibrant, you, you can easily get get machines down there on the secondhand arcade market. Yeah, I was thinking companies like Ours to Crap Leisure would want all their machines scrapped and would want off to escape. But, oh, yeah, good they are around. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, thanks. Anyone? No, that's all right. Yep, got some more, Scotty. So don't go away. No, that's all right. Uh, hi there, it's Bernard VK5 Fabian. I'm interested to know how it resets the uh, counters to zero. I can see it up counting, but how do you get it to zero? Um, when it first powers on, it'll latch the start relay, um, and then that will reset all the counters to zero. So uh, when you when you unplug it, or the start relay gets tripped uh, in the baseboard. Um, all the counters will, will clack around and they'll and they'll reset to zero and you'll be ready to go and then it will count backwards um, down to um, zero on the on the on the ball unit as well so that's how the machine knows knows it's at zero yeah awesome there Scotty and uh, all right is there any other questions from Adelaide um, Hayden is there any from uh, YouTube? Uh, there's one in the Zoom chat from Kim VK5FJ. Yep, I'm just trying to. And there's also a comment from Ivan there as well. Um, Scott, uh, is that in the chat? Yeah, in the Zoom chat. Uh... <laughs> yeah, Kim. As soon as we open up the loom. Uh... Are the solenoids the same as vending machines on that area? That's a very good question, Kim. I've not had the pleasure of opening up a um, a vending machine from that era. Um, but a lot of the solenoids between machines are the, are the same. Um, Ivan, you'll do vinyl graphics when you're ready. Awesome. Um, yeah, sounds good. Uh, I will I will get in touch with you, actually. Um, we will, yeah, look at making up some stencils and then I'll, um, I'll let you know when we're ready to go. That, that's very good. Yes, Ivan has a very nice vinyl machine, that is for sure. So, Scott, I've got a quick question. Yep. Um, it's uh, uh, five triple E here. Um, Chris, I was just wondering with the um, the play make you showed earlier with the picture of the three or four wide, the contacts in a circular pattern or sort of yep. like a circular pattern. 
Yep, and yep. Uh, you had like a, I didn't really see the wiper. You couldn't see the wiper very well down the bottom. You sort of showed that in the bottom right hand side. Yep. Just curious as to how much wear you had on the actual ball contacts and how the, the wiper was yeah. actually attached. So the wi- the wipe the wiper um, is I'll I'll bring the photo up. You can also see my screen share still. Yeah. So I'll bring I'll bring the bigger photos up because it will it will um, allow you to see it in a little bit higher resolution. Um, let me get rid of all this stuff here. So you're talking about this unit here. Yeah, I think that was it. But I saw saw the um, one of the the cleanup photos earlier on in actual in actual your presentation in your slide shots. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yeah. Okay. This one here. Yeah, that one there. So yep. I was just wondering. You, you, I think you showed the wiper before, but I couldn't really see it. Was that on the back of that other photo you just showed before? I thought you showed it on a slightly different one. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah, that. Yeah. Yep. So that's the wiper in the middle, or uh, two no. wipers. Yeah, so this this is a shaft. So there's a wiper yeah. up the there's a there's a series of wipers up the top and a little um. Oh, looks... you know, I see it now because it all sort of blended yeah. into one. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, got that. Uh, yeah okay. Because because the rust the rust blended in, but I can see those two. Yeah, different, yeah. Um, yeah. Um. So yeah, basically they're little um sort of metal pins on a sprut yeah. with a little yeah. spring yeah. Little underneath kind them. of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Another one, yeah. another style. So, the wear on them wasn't actually too bad. It was pretty okay. good. There's de- there's definitely been maintenance and upkeep on this machine yeah. over the years because some so parts didn't have the, enough wear on the pins, them. The pins didn't look too flattened off or anything like that at all, like as no, in the, the, they, the ball ones. Yeah, no, no, okay. they're still. Okay. They're still got I guess being AC, it probably doesn't arc as much like a D2 one would. So, yeah, being yeah. AC, it it does arc, um, but yeah, not not all that bad, and we're not talking massive voltage. Um, yes. So you're not you're not drawing thousands of volts and giant you know yeah. arcs. It's it's all fairly low voltage AC stuff. It also and what, and what actually what actually operates that mechanism? What what drives that rotating part of it? Uh, so underneath, uh, as as in what's the player action that gets that going? Sorry, is what I mean. Ah, uh, when you that. yeah when you when you hit various uh, pop bumpers on the oh. um on the on the um inside the play area on the play area yeah yep. no worries cool yep. and then yes. it, and then it just runs off uh, off the off the gear here yeah right yep. perfect thanks so do we have any, do we have any more questions for scott one more scotty here it goes yep mark again of uh, having wired up stuff like that years ago is there any id on the um on the cabling or is it just wire point to point or was it faded or were the wires color coded originally or- yeah no wires are color coded um, <laughs> yeah the, so on the, on this in the in the in the player uh baseboard um unit so uh, in the schematics i will pull them up for you Oh, so in the schematics, um, you, you can see here that there's red, <laughs> uh, yellow and black, green, brown and white, orange and white, blue and white, green and white, um, or black and white from memory. So yeah, uh, blue and white. Yeah, so there is a color code abbreviation here. Inside the bottom board of the machine, the wire coloring is, is really good. Uh, but on stuff that's been exposed, particularly in the back box, uh, we're going to have a very hard time finding the colour. So you can sort of see down here, it's it's not too bad. Um, it's all white and brown. <laughs> it's all white and brown. So it's PVC, is it? Or is it cotton? Covered? No, it's, it's uh, cotton. cotton. It's cloth. Covered. It's all and cloth it, covered. Uh, yeah. And wax lacing twine, I gather. Yep, it's wax wax lacing twine. Uh, my brother's an aircraft engineer, so we're gonna re re wax lace it all. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we'll be right. <laughs> we'll we'll get through it. <laughs> um, but it's all good fun, and for me, it's a big learning experience. You know, I've never done anything like this, so 
I'm having a bundle of fun. So, yeah, it's good. There's an example of the non-existent coloured wiring. Yeah, that's just awesome, Scotty. That really is. It's just a lot yeah. of white and brown. Yep. I was going to say, that, that's exactly the same colour that they use to wire up Toyotas, just out of interest, you know? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and I was going to say to you, if you uh, once you've actually learned how to do all your, uh, your wax lacing, you'll be good to go to work with your brother on the aircraft. That's it. Yeah, yep. Um, the other question I've got for you, Scott, is um, yep. with a lot of the soldering, um, I'm, I'm gathering that you would uh, you would find some nasty smells when you hit the solder. You do, uh, with the yeah. Line. Yep, yep. Um, it's all leaded stuff, which is. Well, it's the only know, kind of solder. Yeah, you know? it's the only kind of solder that you have. Uh, hasn't been too bad. Some of the some of the uh, when you when the smoke particularly hits some of those coils, um, they they have that lovely aroma smell coming off them. Um, the burnt coil smelt particularly good. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, and that's that's part of the experience is, is the smell of it, um, <laughs> as I always say, you know. I was going to um, say, too, um, I wonder how many credit cards get wiped by uh, by standing too close to one of your machines. Yeah, uh, not not too bad. Uh, the coils are cheap. I've, I've so far, other than the initial cost of buying um, the machine and a few consumables, I spent about $80.00 so far um okay. that cost is bound to go up um absolutely but um i don't think it'll be over the top expensive yeah and the last comment i was going to make with your schematic up there scott those uh, those things that look like capacitors are contacts um, they are contacts yeah it's, on it's the, a lattice the little line diagram switch. so um yeah it, it's pretty funny um, to, it is uh, it is quite read. funny and i'm sure if andy akh was here he'd be having conniptions he would be absolutely um and what's quite funny is um i've had a good good chat with our otis lift tech um at work because uh they there are 1970s vintage lifts and this is right up his alley um, so <laughs> so we've had a we've had a good chat about about how all this works so yeah it'll be a lot of fun so all your all your switching and contacting um it it looks daunting but just take it step by step. Work out what doesn't work, and then, and then work backwards. It's Chris Five CP again. So, hello. Just tell me, I'm interested in how this part works. I remember, you know, you hit the ball and it hits the, the rubber rubber bumper. All right, yep. and then it gets spat out from the rubber bumper. Yep. What's the process of putting that energy into the ball? As in, how does the bumper spit it out? Uh, it is basically. Um, probably have a underneath of the playing field here so springs plunges in here that's that's basically all it is is a plunger shooting out with the with the magnetic force is is basically what controls how they all bump off each other so you can see the mechanisms here, the metal plungers. If those metal plungers are dirty, the machine will feel very sluggish. So the cleaner, the cleaner they are, the 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 more sort of, I guess, life your your machine will have. Um, so yeah, it's certainly about how clean you can make the plungers, and making sure that there's no slack in in these mechanisms as well will play a big part into how the machine plays and feels. When it's on the when the ball's bouncing around. Okay, thanks, man. Yeah, they're fantastic shots there, Scott. I think we're all uh, we're all looking forward to uh, seeing your next video of uh, of someone actually playing on that particular machine. And yeah, it'll go and ring a ding ding. It'll be uh, good. It'll be good. There's, there's, a, there's a few people here with mobile phones. I've noticed looking on Gumtree at the moment for secondhand <laughs> pinball machines. Um, and uh, you're, you're doing rather well at $450 and a few hundred hours of service because uh, some of the prices there, you can put a few zeros out the back of that uh, machine. Exactly right. You you certainly can. And look, this is this is um, yeah. I I th I thought if I could get this for under a thousand dollars, I've done well. Um, so yeah, certainly mates rates did come into this um, because the guy I bought it off is actually a colleague of my brother's at his at his work. So um, that that certainly helped out. 
Yeah, fantastic. All right, so is there any other questions here from Adelaide? From the, from the top rooms here? No, shakings of heads. That's great. Hayden, any more questions from YouTube or from Zoom that you've seen? No, I think that's uh, I think that's everything. So, so Scotty, I think you've uh, you've answered it really well. So uh, I'd like to thank you on behalf of all of us here on a great talk. It's certainly another yeah, absolutely. topic. Um, there's a number of people here that are uh, reminiscing about their youth um, and uh, when they worked on such machines. <laughs> so yeah. a really, really poignant topic. And uh, yeah, really absolutely fabulous to hear something a little bit more other than radio related. Yeah, and I mean, as as I've said, you know, sort of as for me, I didn't grow up with this stuff, so it's it's an awesome learning experience. It gives me a taste of what a lot of people in the club their their you know experience has been like, and you know what their youth would have been like, and it's exciting. It's good. We need more uh, more memories. Memories. It, it's certainly it's gotten. I think the the fun thing for us will be to uh, to see a few sh action shots as uh, when you're actually working on this and. Uh, don't be shy to fire it up onto the mailing list for us so that we can all uh, oh, have yeah, a bit of a absolutely. goosey and ask lots of questions because you've uh, absolutely you've spurred on. I think uh, Chris CP was telling me there's a place that we can do lock-ins with old pinball machines here somewhere in Adelaide. So I yeah. can see a group of us going off to uh, drink beer and play pinball. Um, That's at, it. <laughs> and look, if, if anyone's feeling adventurous, um, I will post when once the... Uh, uh, Pinfest Newcastle's been announced. Um, that's a that's a whole weekend that's run by the Newcastle Pinball Association, um, where they have tons of machines from electromechanical all the way through to the modern day stuff, um, where the machines are on free pay free play for the whole weekend. Um, that's like fifty bucks entry, you know. So I'm, I'll I'll hopefully have this machine there if if anyone wants to come and have a play um, for themselves. Yeah, by all means. We'll, we'll be we'll be crossing our fingers, Scott, that uh, New South Wales comes out of the naughty box and uh, yeah, we're, that's it. we're all able to come visit. All right, well, listen, I'd like to thank you on behalf of everyone here and also those on the internet as well for, for a great talk. It's been really great fun. So a round of applause. And uh, so we'd like to hear some more at, uh, of your adventures as you go forward. So uh, yeah, thanks absolutely. again, Scott, for uh, a really no interesting worries. topic tonight. Over. Easy done. No worries. All right. If that's the, if that's the uh, that's the end there, we'll uh, we'll.